Welcome to the School of Public Policy series, Spotlighting Professionals with Careers in Public Policy. Today, we invite you to join the conversation as alumna Shelley Nichol joins us to discuss her career and her work in higher education policy. Hi, I'm Whitney Sheridan, Director of Communications for the School of Public Policy at Penn State with Katherine Baumgartner. She's our Director of Professional Development and Student Engagement. Hi, Katherine. Hi, Whitney. Great to be here today. Hi, Shelley. Good morning. Shelly Nickel is a strategic policy advisor leading state higher education systems and institutions planning and executing complex initiatives, including consolidations and enterprise-wide solutions. She focuses on providing students with a pathway for successfully completing their higher education goals. Her experience was primarily gained in Georgia, both in state government and as an executive in the University System of Georgia and now includes the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. She contribute, attributes most of her professional success to her educational experience at Penn State and holds a Master of Public Administration degree and a Bachelor of Science degree in Community Development from Penn State. Welcome, Shelley. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to do this. So this is a discussion that's an opportunity for you, our attendees, to talk to Shelly about her career path and her role. We want to encourage your questions throughout the discussion, so do not hesitate to use the Q&A or the chat at any time throughout the talk. So I guess, Shelly, to start, we want to ask you to explain a little bit about your career path from your undergraduate degree in community development to pursuing your MPA and then into your career. Was this a direction that you had always planned to take? Well, um, to start out, I probably applied to, I don't know, 20 colleges and universities. And most of them were small liberal arts. I grew up in Pennsylvania in the Pocono Mountains. Most of them were small liberal arts colleges. And then I finally found this program called Community Development. And it was exactly what I was looking for. I wanted to learn about how communities could be involved in uh, changing public policy. And that degree program, which unfortunately no longer exists, um, helped me and, and got me into the right the right field to start my, my career. I had really not much of an idea of what I wanted to do when I grew up, but it was a, a good start. And it was really teaching about systems theory and about mm -hmm. how one policy development and implementation can really, imp, you know, change something else that has already been implemented. Um, there are unintended consequences of everything. We also studied um, community involvement um, with um, Saul Alinsky, um, one of the founders and, and um, really fathers of um, community involvement from the um, uh, ground up, uh, actually doing door to door. I actually did a practicum doing door to door, um, you know, knocking on people's doors and asking them if they were bothered by certain things in their community. That was in Des Moines, Iowa um, in the wintertime. So a, a very interesting place to be in the winter. And I was telling you earlier that one of the funniest things that happened to me on that practicum was I heard a commercial on TV. Um, it was, are your hogs cranky? <laughs> and growing up in Pennsylvania, I had never heard any commercials about the status of your hogs. But anyway, it was a, you know, something new to learn um, during your practicum. So anyway, that started me in the pathway and I graduated from there and ended up working for a little while in Harrisburg um, and then decided I wanted to get a master's degree in public administration. Again, not really having much of a focus of what I wanted to do with that degree, but I thought state government was probably a good place to start. Uh, and I took classes in all the policy areas and, and budget being one of them and um, really thought that wasn't really what I was interested in. I wasn't really crazy about the curriculum and, and following it. But after I graduated, I got a job in um, the governor's budget office in 
Georgia. My then husband and I had moved to um, Atlanta. And by chance, a Penn State professor who I had while I was in my MPA program had moved to Georgia State University. I visited with him when I first moved there and he had connections with the governor's office, budget office. And so that he helped me get my first job in Georgia so many years ago. So there's a Penn State, there's a Penn Stater everywhere. I found that out many, many times um, through travel and through um, through work. So that was my first job um, learning about state government. And what I quickly learned is that the budget is the biggest tool that you can have to implement public policy. And so learning about <clears throat> the budget process in Georgia, how things get done and using the budget as that tool was a great grounding place for me um, to learn a whole new state, whole new state government, but also you know, how you implement public policy in, uh, in state. Um, statewide system. So it really was um, the, the first part of that long career that I had in Georgia. So you mentioned, you know, not being sure about wanting to go into working in the state budget office and with the state budget. Um, was that about, you know, being a little hesitant to work with numbers? And uh, what well, what was your take on that and how did you overcome, you know, that hesitancy in, in working with the bu with budgets? I, I think what I didn't understand while I was taking classes is that, you know, budgets are really the numbers are almost irrelevant. It is mm -hmm. a way to talk about public policy, given mm -hmm. that a governor or a um, community has to have a budget to implement um, on a, a fiscal year basis. Mm -hmm. And so the budget really represents priorities for that state or that entity. And it's, um, a, as I mentioned, a tool to implement public policy. And I really don't think I understood that because we were learning in um, the MPA program program more the nuts and bolts of budgeting rather than mm -hmm. the tying it to the big bigger picture of public policy i mean i think it probably was presented that way but i was too naive to understand it so you know i'm not putting it on the curriculum i'm, I'm taking um responsibility for that that i wasn't quite sure what where where i was going with it but once I got that job and understood um, the importance of the budget, um, you can any any company, any nonprofit, any government entity all has a budget and it mm -hmm. all represents basically what your priorities are for that coming year and for years um, into the future. So I think, you know, when people say follow the money, it is a really important um, uh, little idiom to, to think about when you're um, thinking about, well, how do I get this done? Mm -hmm. And it is, it is promoting something. You have to understand the cost of it, mm -hmm. but it is promoting an idea. And I've always said to people, you know, my job throughout my career, you know, I stayed in the budget office for um, a little while and then moved on to broader public policy arena. But it, it really is um, something that you you have to gravitate to. You have to you're you are selling an idea. You are selling a, um, a product that is changing, going to change people's lives, a program, an idea. So it's not about selling cars or selling food. It's mm -hmm. about selling a broader picture that people's lives will be impacted by what you do. This is, I'm talking about public policy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what really intrigued me. The, the whole idea of being able to, at the end of the day and every day saying, um, what were my efforts and how did that imp impact people's lives in a positive way? So I, you know, I felt like I could um, be very um, 
feel good about myself during this career because I did feel like I was impacting people in a positive way. And I think that's part of my my DNA. I want to help people. So, yeah. Yeah. And I want to remind our guests that we're open for questions. Use that Q&A or the chat at any point during this discussion. So, Michelle, I'd like to pick up a little bit on what you've just spoken about um, with respect to data um, and how to use data effectively. As you know, in public policy careers, a lot of what happens is gathering data, analyzing data, and then somehow needing to package that data in a way that that makes an impact. So you've had a lot of experience doing that, um, making high stakes budget and policy presentations. What do you find effective? What are some of the things that you've done that have allowed you to communicate your data in such a way that it influences other people to accept your vision? I think being very clear is really, really important. Um, you know, I try to make only three points, three main points. Mm -hmm. If I have a PowerPoint, I try not to put too many words on the PowerPoint. If I provide a graph, I graphically tell people, this is what you are seeing. Start on the left. This is where, this is what this means. And if you go to the right, you are seeing this because People get confused if you're talking too much or a lot about what they are seeing. They need to be honed in on, okay, what's the point of this? Um, mm -hmm. You know, why are you telling me this? So start off with three main points. What I'm going to tell you today is this. And the reason I'm telling you is, and the importance of this and what I want you to get out of this and do with this information um, at the end of, of this session. So I think um, know your audience. I think that's very important when you're talking to chief executives. You don't want to get in the weeds. You want to stay very high level. You need to be able to answer weedy questions. Um, but but you start at the very top and say, why, why is this important for the state of X or the community of X or um, the nonprofit to be interested in this idea? And how would we implement it? Who would be impacted in what ways? Are there unintended consequences, unintended consequences, which of course there always are. Mm -hmm. And then very importantly, how will we assess whether or not we did what we said we were going to do? And those are all key things that I think need to be presented in some respect um, to any kind of policy um, discussion. And then after you've presented a budget or policy um, presentations. I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you analyze or critique the results or your performance of a presentation. What are your strategies there with your team or with your boss perhaps? Well, I want to go back to Catherine's question okay, a little bit because I wanted to make sure I under uh, said about the data Using the data is so important because your story has to be grounded in something. Mm -hmm. And so you have to ground it in, in the data. And then if I switch to Whitney's question, when you want to go back to assess whether you've done something um, with after you've implemented, you use the same data that you used to sell the idea or talk about um, the implementation and you match that up and you say, OK, this is what we said we were going to do. Did we actually do it? So the data is extremely important in assessing whether or not you were successful in promoting that idea. You either, you know, you talk to a chief executive, a team of people. In my case, it was a governor and his chief um, chief of staff and department heads and, and other folks sitting around a table. And you have to read the room, so to speak, watch body language, understand the questions that they are asking, 
answer them if you know the answer. If you don't know the answer, say, I'll have to get back to you on that. I just, I don't know that, don't have that data with me or, or whatever. I think being authentic is very, very important in those presentations. Um, be transparent. If you don't know something, say you don't know it. Um, being authentic, I think, means that let your personality um, show through when you're talking about um, these um, these public policy areas, because it is something you get passionate about when you're trying to sell an idea. It becomes part of you and you understand the nuances of that and being able to tell people that story is is very important. One of the um I'll call it a trick I used to use, is personalizing something. If you know something about the people in the room and why they would be interested in this particular area, talk about that so that to each person, it means something to them. Say to them, you know, this is, you know, this impacts people um, who have children who are autistic. And talk about how that is of importance in their lives and in other people's lives. And it, you know, I think that's make when people can can personally um, see themselves being changed by something. It makes a, a big difference in whether they um, can agree with you or need more information or whatever. I think I went around the bend there. So if I <laughs> If I didn't hit the mark, please draw me back in. No, no, that, that, that's really great. I mean, it's, what, it's, what it's making me think about is just how you learn how to do that. Um, what, what kinds of mentors or who did you watch? How did you figure out how to navigate? Um, because obviously we, we talk about that in the theoretical yeah. sense, yeah. but in practice, who were you looking to? Who, who yeah. taught you how to do that? Um, I think I taught myself by looking at other people, you know, they tell people, tell you to, you know, watch people and learn from your mistakes. Well, I think you learn from your mistakes, but also from the things that you've done well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I try to look at every experience and say, what can I take away from this? Why did they ask that question? What were they looking for? Um, why, why did that conversation go this direction when I was trying to lead it that direction? And I think talking with colleagues after the fact is a really good way to sort of you know, debrief and say, what did you think that was like? And, you know, I mean, sometimes these things don't go well. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of like, what should I have done differently? Because sometimes what happens is you get down a rabbit hole, somebody grabs a hold of something you say, they take it in a totally different direction. And you're just kind of lost. And your point mm -hmm. is lost. And if you can't grab it back in, um it's real it's really hard to to um sway people when mm -hmm. you didn't really get to do what you thought you were going to do but you have to be prepared to do that as well to sort of get the conversation back on on track i've been down many many rabbit holes they aren't <laughs> pretty <laughs> there there's no way out sometimes so i i think it's um really doing self-examination, first of all, but then inviting people to critique you and mm -hmm. not being um, upset about what they say, trying to really put yourself over here and say to yourself, these people are trying to help me. How can I do this better next time? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think I've had the opportunity to, ask people um shamelessly to help me you know i want to i want to be better at this and i i want to understand how to prepare myself for these kind of situations and i think um after a few times when you 
give good information, you do the right thing, you study, you have correct data, you talk authentically, I think then people become, they trust you. Mm -hmm. And that is a key thing in public policy. If you are trusted to give accurate information, then you're more likely to be able to promote um, new ideas and, and get them to execution. And so I think that, you know, when I talk about authenticity and being your true self, I think that's all a big piece of that trust that if people think you're faking it um, and they can smell that, right, you know, from the way you talk or the way you prepare yourself, um, I, I think it's harder to um, to be able to tell your story and tell the story of uh, that particular policy. So mm -hmm. I, I, I really coach people to, you know, practice in front of a mirror, practice mm -hmm. with friends, um, practice with somebody who does not talk budget ease or any kind of lingo. Try not to use acronyms because the rest of the world doesn't use your acronyms. Mm -hmm. My husband used to tease me all the time because I'd be on the phone with somebody and it would be all, you know, ABCs and DFA and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you please just say that in English? So it's good because there will be people in your, in your um, room and in your people you're trying to sway who don't have the background you have. So it, try to speak, um, you know, to people on the street and explain things very realistically. That's great advice. And we have our first question. A reminder, we are open for questions anytime using the Q&A or the chat. Here's one. It's thrilling to hear your story. Very concise and intriguing. This is from one of our students. Um, have you... How do you face rejection of your ideas from higher officials? How do you handle this? How do you recreate your stories or find another point of view? Good question. Um, and I've been rejected many, many times. Um, it's not, it, it, public policy is not easy. Uh, I think one of the best things that you can do is do self-examination first and, you know, think about, well, could I have done something differently? But at the end of the day, you make the best case that you can make and then you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. um, there are times when you walk away from it. There are times when you come back to it because you really think, you could make another point that could possibly change the direction of, of that particular um, request. Um, but I think it's it is tough. The first you know first couple of years of my um, my career, I had some you know a lot of things that didn't go the way that I had hoped they would. I will tell you a funny story about one that did go my way. I happened to wreck my car on the way into um, a budget meeting with the governor. And of course they told the governor that yeah, I had wrecked my car. And I think, you know, of course he asked me how I was after I got in the, in the meeting. And they asked me if I wanted to delay it to the next day. And I, that would have been Saturday. And I thought, I don't really want to come into the office on Saturday. So let's get this done today. And I had worn this um outfit that day that um had it was a vest with little studs on it you know sort of cowgirlish looking but not in a but in a tasteful way I should say <laughs> and anyway the governor happened to be a real cowboy kind of guy and so I went into this meeting and did my thing and and I got everything that I wanted added to the budget. And I came back out and talked to my colleagues and they were saying, well, how did it go? And I was like, yeah, thumbs up, everything worked out. And they teased me because they said that I used my car accident and this little vest that I had on <laughs> to endear the, the, the governor. And I don't know if I did that on purpose or, or not, but it, it worked out and it was pretty fun. And um, 
I felt like I had a win that day. So uh, sometimes you use props, I guess. <laughs> So thank you for that question um, and that great example. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit if, if you could explain some of the policy issues. You're talking a lot about the presentations that you've done. If you could maybe explain some of the policy issues that you've helped influence and talk to us about your role in the policy process throughout your career. So I started out in, as I mentioned, in the governor's budget office, and I ended up working in um, higher education public policy and um, it, being responsible for the University System of Georgia's budget, which is, you know, was a billion dollar budget at that point in time. And so I learned a lot about um you know, what was happening in higher education. And that was, you know, quite a few years ago. And then I actually moved into working for the university system um, in budget and then a, in a higher capacity um, as an executive. But the the whole, the, the um, trying to ch change people's lives remained kind of the theme throughout my career in terms of what we were doing with the information we had and trying to make things different. So one of the po uh, policy areas later in my career was of course, retention and graduation. And we were very convinced that we could do a much better job at um, getting students into college, um, and getting them out of college. Um, the numbers, you know, we had 26 institutions at that time and the numbers, you know, at the larger universities like UGA and Georgia Tech obviously had very high retention rates and graduation rates. The rest of the system, you know, were kind of um, ho-hum and some were really, really poor. So we tried to attack this as a system approach, which was 26 individual institutions and mm -hmm. trying to raise those rates. And there were many, many policy areas that were impacted, financial aid being one. Um, so scholarships and financial aid, how do you make sure that students have the right amount of money mm -hmm. to be able to complete their degrees? peeling apart the whole academic process of what classes you take mm -hmm. in what order so that students have, are prepared to take in the succession um, that will make them successful was another um, great policy area that we worked on. Um, we changed from uh, trimesters to semesters mm -hmm. because that was supposed to, to um, help with our students' longevity, um, getting practicums. I mean, so, so what I'm trying to, to say is there might be one large public policy that you are trying to impact over many, many, many years, but it, there are many strategies that can take place and that can happen in order to do to impact that. What you have to understand is when you do things like that, um, you don't know whether one worked and the other didn't, um, you know, because they're all happening at the same time. So you have to be careful to make sure you analyze singly each of those different programs to make sure you're moving things in the right direction in all of all of those ways. So I think um, my career um, was always trying to fix things. You know, I found things that were broken. Financial aid was one of those areas that was a huge, um, I guess, hole. People, um, the, the rules and regulations for financial aid is like a 900 page volume of this is how you're supposed to do the, and this is all from the federal government. And then mm -hmm. states have their own and individual institutions have their own rules and regulations. So trying to figure out how to make the process easier from a student's perspective, as opposed to from the bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. um, so my mantra always was, what's in the best interest of our students? And so we would sit around the table and think about all these things. Well, guess what? There weren't any students in the room. 
So how did we know what was in the best interest of students um, <laughs> with a bunch of, you know, gray haired old ladies thinking, you know, trying to think about what to do. And we needed to have focus groups and understand how it, what it was like for a student to fill out the FAFSA and what are the parents having to go to through. And so anyway, um, I think it was, it was a, a whole, you know, you have, when you start thinking of things through the student's eyes, it, becomes a whole different way of understanding the impact that you can make. And you have to have the student's voice in order to think about what is in the best interest of the student. So that was kind of a very eye opening. When you look around the room and you see, well, we're, we're talking about what's going to happen to them and we have no idea what's really going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. yep. I think that is my mantra though, um, <laughs> you know, that you really do it's, need yeah. um, to do things from the student's perspective, because that is what higher ed is about. So, mm -hmm. A reminder that we're open for questions, so don't hesitate to use the Q&A or the chat. So Shelly, you've seen a lot of things happening through the years, not only in Georgia, but in other aspects with higher education. If you had to distill it down to what you think is the main issue or the biggest challenge for higher education today, what would it be? Um, I would say that higher education has had the luxury of remaining um, stable and um, old school for very, a very, very, very long time, you know, a thousand years. And <laughs> um, students of today learn, I think students have always learned differently. But I think today we understand that people learn differently and can learn via different vehicles and, and in different methods, as opposed to literally an old white dude standing in front of the class and espousing their thoughts on something. Things are very different today. You can get information from social media, from online, from books online, um, from small groups, from other types of readings and lectures and um, talking with people. So it's not just a one-way conversation any longer. So I think that to me, the recognition that that is not just a fad that we're going through, that this is the, the this is how higher education should be, uh, that faculty are extremely um, valuable in directing that conversation, but it doesn't have mean that that person has to be standing in front of a room always mm -hmm. with the students being silent in their chairs. Mm -hmm. And I think that to me is a, um, you know, and I, I believe that, that that is a change that has started to occur. I mean, I think of when I was in college at Penn State, I didn't challenge my professors ever. I mean, even if I wanted to ask a question, it was never a challenging one. It was just, you know, explain that mm -hmm. further or something. And I think students today, you know, are, are a lot more forthcoming and have the ability to um, not only challenge, but really to, to um, ask the questions, the the that are important. So I appreciate that. And I think that's, you know, higher ed is built, a lot of public higher ed is built on enrollment. And so always getting more and more students builds up budgets so that they can do more things and, you know, be a better university. Well, you know, we're not always gonna have more and more students and we need to figure out how to be the best that we can be at where we are and really try to do, you know, be, um, have the best public policy program in the country, uh, which is what I want Penn State to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how do we do that? And what do we, what should our specialty be? Because we can't be all things to all mm -hmm. people. So how do we make sure that we are doing, um, doing higher ed for the students of, you know, our program and doing it the best that we can do it and how it will excel 
um, the students will excel in in that regard. So um, those are my my initial thoughts, um, Catherine, to that question. Great, great. So that student experience is absolutely critical to yeah. to yeah. what you see as as a challenge. And uh, yeah. yeah, we're right there with you. We want to also be <laughs> right up there with the best of them. Yes. yes, absolutely. And speaking of our, our our current students who are thinking about graduating, getting ready to graduate and hunting for jobs, you've been in several different positions in different sectors. Um, how do you what do you would you say to them when comparing different workplace sec, different workplace cultures? Mm -hmm. Well, first, let me say that you know, I'm a planner by trade, but I never planned my career. And I just want to make sure that you as a student understand that whatever you think maybe today that your career is going to look like, it may not look like that. You, it's going to take possibly twists and turns like mine did. And um, I had a phenomenal career and really, really uh, got to do many, many things, including be interim president at a couple of colleges and budget director for the state of Georgia and things like that. And, and I would have never predicted that for myself. Um, it just, um, I put myself in certain situations that those things, those things were offered to me. But um, I think, you know, when you think about career choices and workplaces and you have to be comfortable um working in certain places and you you know challenge yourself to um you know to look at options that perhaps you wouldn't have looked at i would have not even thought about you know state government as being the place that i spend most of my career but I loved it. I absolutely loved it because it gave me that big picture <laughs> of public policy throughout um, the state of Georgia. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, you can talk about that in any state. Um, it really, rather than being involved in as being an expert in one particular field, I enjoyed the bigger picture and knowing something about mostly everything um, you know, an inch, maybe an inch deep, but knew how to get answers if I needed them and knew people in all of those other fields. So I, I really, I liked having that bird's eye view. So it, I think it is, comes down to personality. You know, mm -hmm. you, you need to think about, am I one of those people who wants to be heads down in a particular field in the environment, in fossil fuel, in something? Or do I want, do I enjoy knowing some, a lot, a little bit about a lot of different things? So. And, and I hear, I, I love, I love your, your reflection on that because I'm hearing a lot about it's some, some of it's your instinct. Some of it's trusting your gut. And, and what if, what if, what happens if you are in a situation where you've maybe accepted something and you realize this just isn't going to work for me? Um, how do you bow out gracefully? Well, I do have an example of that too. I, I um, reflected upon funny. that the other day that at, at one point I did take a job. I accepted a position at a um, really good institution um, in their budget office. And I <clears throat> got there and realized that that really was not the role that I wanted to be in. And so I... <laughs> I thought about it for a very long time on, you know, not a long time, but very deeply. How am I going to make this decision? How am I going to tell these people now that I've already accepted the job? How am I going to tell them this really isn't for me? I mean, I had to tell the president of the university. It's, it was not, you know, just going in and saying, you know, sorry, Joe, I didn't, I don't, this isn't me. <laughs> so I, you know, came did a lot of um, self-reflection and did some really crazy things. Like if I open my eyes and I see green, you know, you're supposed to go or whatever, you know, <laughs> stupid, uh, stupid things that didn't mean anything because I was just searching for the right way to, to do this. But I knew in my heart, I could feel it. This is mm -hmm. not a match for me. Mm -hmm. This just isn't me. And so I just went in and I told them face to face. I didn't want to do it over the phone. I went into the office and I said, I, I'm sorry, I have made a mistake and I am really apologize. And I thought, I hoped there would not be 
bad feelings about it and there weren't um they referred to me <laughs> a certain way from then on in a jokingly uh a joking <laughs> manner but um i think i lived through it and they um appreciated that i was upfront and honest about it so mm -hmm. I, I think that's great advice to do it personally, because a lot of times people are unsure about the best ways to go about that, but, but that's great advice, especially today, now that we have so many ways to contact people via text, via email, um, but that also leaves that line of communication open for potential opportunities down the road. Never forget that you may have to, you know, deal with these people in a, another situation and you don't want to have any bad feelings. So, I, you know, face-to-face mm -hmm. -face always works. Uh, texting is would just not be a good way to go. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It is a very small world. <laughs> yes, it is. it is. Yes. We have a few more minutes for any questions. So send them via the Q&A window or the chat. Um, for our guest, Shelly Nickel. So don't hesitate to use those options and send us your questions. So we have just a few more minutes. Um, Shelly, if you could give advice to yourself when you were a student, what would that might, what would that be? Oh, uh, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of things that I would wish I, I knew then that I know now. I think I have talked about being authentic. I do think um, you have to feel in your gut that you're being your true self. I think that's very, very important. Um, don't try to be somebody else. Uh, it, it just doesn't. You can try to emulate other people that you think you you like the way they present or the way they talk with people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a couple of things. Be true to yourself. Um, really try to understand the way other people, where they're coming from. That's something I think that is, is very important. Um, and then I always say mm -hmm. to myself and other people mean what you say and say what you mean. I think that's um, really very good advice in at any stage of your life. I still say it to myself. So I, that's, um, I think that's a good way to live. Yeah, and Shelly, you're, you're obviously um, still in the midst of a very vibrant career. But if you had to look back over the timeline from where you started to where you are today, um, what's been the most rewarding thing that you've done? Oh, geez. Um, I think the most rewarding thing I've done is mentoring young women. Um, I've had the pleasure of um, growing up in an era when women um really have advanced in the in the field of of public policy and the public sector in general and their voices are heard more so um than they were you know 30 years ago when i started i was the lone woman in the room many many times and i like to be able to tell people, and it, this goes for men um, as well, you know, put yourself in the conversation. If you've been invited to the table, then sit at the table. You are there for a reason. Um, understand the body language in the room. I mean, there are things, times to talk and times to be quiet. However, um, if you are in public policy and you are trying to get a certain viewpoint uh, across it, there is there is when you get the opening to do it, do it and take that opportunity. And I think being mentoring um, younger women, especially, I think has been my joy. So, yeah. I've seen a lot of them just blossom and it makes me feel really good that they're still working and I'm not, but I mean, I am working, but not full time. So, you know, and it's, um, it's great to see them, you know, grow. So I've enjoyed that. 
Great advice. Great advice. Um, Well, thank you so much to our guest, education policy expert, Shelly Nickel. And thank you so much for joining us. We hope you'll join us for the next conversation in the profile series on Wednesday, December 7th at 1130 a.m. with guest Larry Siemens. He's the director of Family Aid, the leading provider of solutions to family homelessness in greater Boston area. I'm Whitney Sheridan with Catherine Baumgartner for all of us with the School of Public Policy. Thanks so much for watching.